Thank you, Dana. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. I think perfect. everybody should. Perfect, perfect. Okay, good. So thanks for this opportunity, Dana and, and Lewis, for setting it up. Um, as Dana mentioned, I was going to speak today about seeing double. Double vision is a big part of what we see in neuro-ophthalmology. And neuro-ophthalmology is that branch of ophthalmology where uh, we deal with not only visual concerns coming from the eye, but as they extend into the brain. And as you'll see today, and hopefully we'll learn a little bit about this, much of double vision actually comes from the brain. doesn't have to. There are many ocular causes, which we'll go through as well. But when, whenever we see a patient complaining of double, there's a pathway to kind of go through, and some of that involves the brain. So uh, I'm a professor at UCI. Uh, I, my fields of interest are neuro-ophthalmology and adult strabismus. Um, and I was at UC, USC prior to this, and I've been and I'm really fortunate and happy to be here for almost uh, two years now. So how should we approach double vision when we see a patient uh, that may have this? So we should ask directed questions, and I'll get into what that means have possibilities in mind, what could be going on here? It's always easier to start from a series of, of hypotheses as opposed to just starting, you know, kind of shooting in the dark. Uh, stay methodical, we have a history where we ask really poignant questions, as well as an examination that helps us get to the bottom of what's going on. Think anatomically, and I'll get into this. Neuro-ophthalmology in general is a field that we really try to hold ourselves to the anatomy, basically how the eye is structured, how the brain is structured and all those parts of the brain that actually feed into us seeing one image. Obviously we have two separate eyes and each eye sees its own thing. They are coordinated, but they are physically in separate places. So for us to see one image out of these two eyes, there has to be a lot of neurological effort that goes into bringing everything together. And that's really the essence of looking at double vision. Where does that process go wrong? And that's what we're looking at. So we use the exam and ancillary tools, which means um, testing uh, to test our hypotheses. And that's the general approach that we take to when we look at this. So that basically there's two main categories of double vision. One is monocular where you're actually seeing double vision with just one eye open. Okay, so if, I, if you look at me here, you know, I have my left eye covered and I still see a second image. That's a monocular double vision, double vision that's perceived with just one eye open. Similarly, if I correct, if I cover my right eye, I'm looking only with my left eye. And if I still see two images, that's called monocular diplopia. Binocular diplopia, which is where we'll spend most of this lecture, is something that where there's a true misalignment. So if you look at me and I am looking straight at me and I have my eyes are lined up, I'm going to see one image, okay? If they're not lined up, if they're crossed, or if they're basically what we call exodeviated or vertically separated, then I'm going to see two images. But if I cover one eye, I'll see just one image. And if I cover the other eye, I'll see just one image because they're misaligned. Each eye sees an image, sees it fine, just not aligned with the other one. So binocular diplopia always resolves if you cover either eye. Monocular diplopia persists if you cover either eye because it's actually coming from the optical properties of the eye. That's a very major fundamental thing that we can touch on later if it needs clarification. So if we have monocular diplopia, here are some things that we look at. And it's actually not an uncommon reason for a patient to present, even though monocular diplopia 99.9% .9 of the time is not neurological and it does not have to do with coming from the brain. It's almost always an ocular issue. It can be confusing uh, for us as physicians, as well as the patient as to what the true problem is. And of course, some patients have both binocular and monocular diplopia. So we have to be able to tease these apart because their treatments, their, the reasons for having them are completely different, okay? So as I mentioned, with monocular double vision, it persists, that double vision persists when, when the eye is covered, okay? So basically when the other eye is covered, you still see it, all right? Images are usually connected or overlapping. That's important. And one image looks like a bit of a ghost image or a superimposed shadow, okay? So what I mean by that is if you see my hands, I would see, I might, may not see two separated images where they're completely separate. I'll see one image kind of a ghost image of the other. Patients can often tell which is the real image and where the ghost image is. And I always ask, is the second image connected to the first? That oftentimes is a way that monocular double vision will, will present. Then what we'll often do is give the patient a pinhole. You've seen these pinholes when you, when you come to the eye doctor. We put the pinhole to see if your vision improves. 
And that usually means there's some sort of refractive error, it means could you use glasses to get your vision a bit more clear? Well, the pinhole has a purpose here when it comes to monocular double vision as well. When we put the pinhole in front, if the, if the double vision is truly monocular, the pinhole tends to resolve that double vision because it only allows a very narrow column of light to go through. And that narrow column of light, when it goes through, you, you basically do away with all the irregularities on the lens or the cornea or anything in the optical system that the eye is. You're basically reducing the aperture of light to just that tiny pinhole, which tends to disrupt and take away some of those aberrations which cause monocular diplopia. So it's a very good test for us that we generally speaking, if somebody comes in saying that they've got double vision that we think could be monocular, I give them the pinhole. If it resolves it, then that component of what they were um, noticing is actually monocular and then we can look further at that, okay? And usually if it resolves, it's something corneal like an irregularity of the tear film, scarring a corneal opacity, which means maybe an area where the cornea is not so clear, dry eyes, very, very common reason for monocular diplopia, uh, as well as cataracts. Sometimes cataracts don't form evenly. There might be little areas on the cataract that are a little bit uh, different. If you look here at the image that I have here, this sort of glowing orange, this is a cataract right here. So this is what we call a posterior subcapsular cataract, a specific form of cataract, which often shows up in patients uh, who have diabetes or on chronic steroid use. And when the light is going through most of the lens, it's, it's unimpeded. But when it goes through this part here, that's cataractus, it blends and it basically causes diffraction. And you see a distorted image, which can often appear as a, um, as a double image, that's a monocular double image, okay? This is something your cornea specialist may do, it's called a corneal topography, where you do a nice uh, map of the cornea. Those of you that have had LASIK surgery may recognize this. This is to see if you've got any irregular astigmatism, anything else like keratoconus, things you may have heard of. Irregular astigmatism and irregular shaped cornea can also give you monocular double vision. This is an, an instrument that we use called a retina scope, which we'll often use to try to see if there's any irregularities on the surface. And I already showed you the pinhole. Occasionally, you may have heard of this thing called an epiretinal membrane. Occasionally that can cause monocular double vision as well. Look at this image here, this is called an OCT. And if you've ever seen an eye doctor, you've probably seen an OCT because most of us use this pretty regularly now. And this is the retina here. And this straight line on top is a membrane that's grown on top of the retina, very common issue in, in, in retinal clinics. And it's called an epiretinal membrane or an ERM. And that causes some contraction of the retina and it often causes an image to look distorted, wavy, and bigger than the other side. So imagine your brain trying to fuse two images together. Okay, the left eye, uh, I'll point to my left eye. The left eye sees a big image. Let's say it has the ERM. And the right eye sees a smaller image. Now, it doesn't really realize that you want to fuse those two images because they are different. That image size disparity creates a problem for the brain trying to fuse the images into one image. So basically, the right eye image being smaller and the left eye image being bigger, the brain becomes confused and unable to adequately fuse those images. Therefore, sometimes you can get double vision just from that, okay? So that's actually an epiretinal memory that can cause diplopia in that way, okay? I'll use the term diplopia and double vision interchangeably because diplopia, as you, as you may know, is, is the te technical term for double vision, okay? So treatments for monocular double vision, as I mentioned, we optimize the tear film and try to correct any corneal irregularities that might be there. Refraction, sometimes monocular double vision resolves with just a good refraction. A pair of glasses that in particular corrects your astigmatism if you have it. Specialized contact lenses, especially for people with keratoconus or irregular astigmatism, is astigmatism that's a lot harder to manage with glasses themselves. Contact lenses can sometimes do a better job. So if somebody has corneal irregularities and warpage and shape issues, we sometimes have more success with contact lenses than with glasses. And sometimes cataract surgery can be helpful if there's lens irregularities. That tends to be um, a really huge thing for patients who have monocular double vision from a cataract, taking rid of the, getting rid of cataract surgery and putting a nice clean lens in there can help as well. But of course we have to have an accurate diagnosis. We need to know that their diplopia is truly monocular and due to a cataract irregularity. And if we can secure that diagnosis, and oftentimes we can do well to help the patient.
Let me spend the bulk of our time on binocular diplopia because that's truly a neuro-ophthalmological problem, okay? And that's really the, the angle that I'm coming for for this lecture. So the extraocular muscles, this is not meant to be confusing or to kind of get into all the weeds here, but just for you to, to sort of recognize that the reason there is so much complexity to this is because each eye actually has six muscles that govern its movement, okay? So there's a left and a right eye, each with six muscles, so 12 muscles that have to work together. And four of those uh, six muscles, or eight of the 12 in terms of total, actually have three different actions. The vertical ones and the oblique ones have a vertical movement, a horizontal, and a torsional movement. So you can think about how many ways things can go wrong when eight of these 12 muscles have three different actions, each of them, and they have to coordinate with the other eye. So that's where it becomes kind of complicated. So when there's six muscles, there's three different nerves that feed those muscles. And that's on the left and on the right, and a whole bunch of brain that controls that as well. So this is where we get into all of this sort of complexity, okay? But keep that in mind. When we're trying to isolate what's going on, we're looking at each of these muscles independently and together, how they're working with each other. And that's the complexity of what we're trying to do. And I put this here, and, and the terminology here is not that important, but just to show that double vision actually can come from any part of the brain and orbit, okay? This is the eye socket known as the orbit. That's the eye itself, the eye muscles that are there. And basically this is the orbital contents, okay? This is where the nerves come together. This is the brainstem. The brainstem is that portion that controls many of your movements of your body, your face, your neck, and the eyes tons and tons of neurological machinery in the brainstem that are devoted to the eyes uh, and eye movements, okay? So we look at all of that. You may have heard of the cerebellum at the very back of the brain. The cerebellum is really an important part for eye movement control as well. So not to get into the details of that, but just so you know, when we're thinking about neurological causes of double vision, we need to consider all of these things through the brain itself and isolate them based on what the factors and findings are, okay? All right, so we have to ask who is our patient. Different ages have different problems, obviously, and that's very, very important here. So in the elderly patients and in, in kids and everyone in between, the, the etiologies of what we consider are often different, even though they overlap. A history of trauma, a history of strabismus in childhood. Um, have there been other problems systemically? Does the patient have hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, many forms of cranial nerve problems, which are the nerves that go to the eye muscles themselves, um, can have a higher incidence of occurring if people have uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension, or even control, just long-standing diabetes and hypertension that can lead to higher risks for these things. Autoimmune problems like lupus, connective tissue problems also can um, relate to there being double vision for a variety of reasons. Giant cell arteritis, an important vasculitis, which is inflammation of blood vessels, that can also be important. And we always ask questions about giant cell arteritis in any patient over 65 presenting with double vision, because that can happen as well, okay? Again, I can't go through everything, obviously, but I want to give you an overall picture of how we do this. And again, I don't want to get into every specific diagnosis here, but I want you to understand of what we think and what you should think if you're going to go see a doctor for double vision, these are questions they may ask you, okay? They ask, is your double vision mostly horizontal? Meaning, are the images displaced side by side? Are they vertically separated or are they diagonal, like obliquely separated? That can be an immense help to the doctor to help figure out what's going on. If they're horizontal, it often tends to be one of a few possibilities. A sixth nerve palsy, the sixth nerve is the one that moves the eye outward. That could be damaged. Thyroid disease, thyroid disease can cause a lot of um, increase in size and fibrosis within muscles, which I'll show you some examples of it. You can have a brainstem stroke among other things. Vertical has other nerves that are involved, including the brainstem. Was it a sudden onset versus gradual? We think of different things that are more sudden, and more gradual. So think about that if you are going to present to a doc, they may ask you those questions. Is it stable, meaning once it, once it happened, has it sort of stayed that way? Or are you noticing the images are slowly coming back together? Are they coming and going? Are there times in which it's perfectly fine and other times in which uh, it's, it's happening kind of you know, pretty badly. We call that intermittent double vision. And that can give us a clue towards a diagnosis as well. So ask yourself, sudden versus gradual, stable versus progressive, intermittent versus constant. Okay, those are important things to kind of think about. And does it change in different fields of gaze? 
also very important. So if I look straight ahead and I see the two images are separated by, you know, let's say this much. And then when I look to the right and I see they really farther separate, they get much more further apart. Or when I look to the left and they're much closer together, that's very helpful. Sometimes just from the history, the doctor can pick that up. So just give that some thought is to say, is my double vision the same in extent and nature, depending on where I'm looking, okay? And that's kind of an important factor as well. Okay, so let's look at a few conditions and some examples. Orbital and eye muscle conditions, as I showed you in that, uh, that MRI initially, we'll go through it from front to back, okay? All right, so here's a, these are all patients of mine over the years, and I wanna just kind of give you an idea of what, what, what we see, okay? This is a 54-year-old man who was having vertical, horizontal, and torsional. Torsional means that there is a, basically a twist to one image relative to the other. So they're not only seeing images separated vertically or horizontally, but one is sort of at an angle relative to the other, which is very hard for the brain to resolve. And this is the patient looking straight ahead, okay? And you can see that left eye is pulled down and into the nose, okay? This is, watch, well, that's trying to patient looking up. I'm sorry, try, he's trying to look up and he's not able to do that. He's looking straight ahead over here, again, downwardly deviated and inwardly of this left eye in particular. And here the patient is trying to look to the left. So you can see there's a pretty irregular pattern here. He's not able to get that eye out to the left here, and he's hardly able to elevate that eye as well. And this is a classic example of thyroid eye disease where the lower muscles, what we call the inferior recti, become so tight, the eye gets dragged downward. And the inner muscles, these medial muscles called the medial recti, they become so tight, they pull the eye in toward the nose. And that's the classic pattern of thyroid eye disease, okay? And so your doctor probably will order a CT scan or MRI scan, and they wanna look at the eye muscles. Trust me, these eye muscles are huge compared to what they normally should be. This is the outer muscle, the lateral rectus, and that, just for reference, is about the normal size of an eye muscle, okay? The inferior rectus here and the medial rectus are several fold larger than they should be on both sides, and that's the classic pattern we see in thyroid eye disease, and that has a myriad of possibilities and problems. You can see here, if the extraocular muscles get too large, they can pinch the optic nerve and cause decrease in vision, which is often, you know, something that needs to be managed kind of aggressively, sometimes surgically or others otherwise with steroids and other medications. Um, but the extraocular muscles can give us significant double vision uh, in this context, okay? Prisms can be used, okay, for these in these situations, either they're a Fresnel prism, uh, which is this one here where you have this basically the stick-on prism, good for temporary use, not for good, great for long-term use, but temporary use, they can be very helpful. These are the prisms we use to measure. They can be ground into the lenses as well. Okay, obviously not up to the 50 over here, but maybe up to about 10. We can grind this into the lenses, which and can help patients quite a bit. And many times that's the first thing that we reach to, unless of course the deviation is so large their prisms are not really a reasonable option. But then surgical options that do exist and oftentimes for the patient that I just showed you, he required surgery and many patients with that level of um, extreme double vision do require surgery. And what we're doing there is finding the eye muscles and moving them around, okay, with these variety of techniques, which I don't really have time to get into, but we can use adjustable suture techniques and so forth. But essentially what we're doing is we're moving the position of the eye muscle. We're passing sutures, actually surgically passing sutures through the eye muscles, cutting them off of the eye and placing them in a position that is more advantageous to get the eyes better lined up, okay? And why I like it and why many of us who do this like it is that no two cases are the same. It's constantly humbling. <laughs> There's many things you can do to help people. Um, but you know, uh, for all 35 of us or 45 of us on this call, we could have the exact same measurement deviations, but the surgical plan may be different. And I'm not exaggerating just because there's so many factors that go into it. But that being said, it can be very helpful. This is a patient, not the same one that you just saw, but had thyroid eye disease. And you can see I drew a white line through just to show the degree of misalignment. And what we did was basically weaken the lower muscle here and weaken the upper muscle here to bring them into the better alignment. And the alignment was much improved by doing that. And that's the strategy with thyroid eye disease is where we'll reduce the amount of tension in those muscles by releasing them. Okay. 
not to get into too much technicalities, but just to see what we do. Now, again, sticking with our orbital conditions, okay? Have a look at this extreme diplopia that's there from progressive myopia. Myopia is, of course, nearsightedness. And if you're very nearsighted, your eye becomes quite long, okay? And then it, the muscles, which I'll show you in MRI in a minute, the muscles surround the eyeball, right, in the, in the orbit. And if the eye has basically become too large, it can shift out of the, sorry about that, my computer fell. It can shift out of the muscle cone and those eye muscles can become displaced, okay? And as they get displaced, they can give you severe problems in their orientation, okay? And here we go. This is the, this is the, the patient that I was showing you. And what I wanna show you is this. This is actually where her upper muscle, this is called the superior rectus. That's where it should be. This is the lateral rectus, and this is where it should be. I just basically put this little ovoid in there. That's where they should be. But because this eyeball has gotten so long, it sort of herniated these muscles into, an, uh, into the wrong position. So now if the muscles are working just fine, but they're in the wrong position, they're going to have all kinds of weird vectors in the way they pull. And that's why the eye becomes so extremely um, mis misaligned like you just saw uh, for that patient. She has similar problems here on the, in the left side, but the right is much worse, okay? So basically one has to recognize that this is the reason for the double vision. If you start tightening muscles and so forth, they're gonna create this, you're gonna make it worse. So here, what we did, what I noted was this, this is actually the eye muscle over here. I hope I'm not grossing people out. This is supposed to be after dinner. So uh, it's fine, but anyways, this is, um, this is where the eye muscle should be. That's the lateral rectus, okay, that I was showing you. That's where it should be. It should be going, minding its own business, going right across, laterally going straight across, but it's deviated downward like I showed you here, you see? Like I showed you, that lateral rectus is down here. It's not up here, okay? And so that's what's happened. This has become misplaced, and that's where it should be, but it's down here, okay? Yeah. Same thing with the superior rectus, that upper muscle that you saw was nasally displaced, okay? Here's where it should be, but it's sort of pushed medially, okay? It's pushed nasally, so it's not working in the right spot. It can be a perfect muscle, but if it's not pulling in the right direction because it's, because it's mal-oriented uh, uh, along the globe, then it's not gonna function properly, okay? So in this situation, simply, what I did was just go and basically sew those muscles together in a better um, orientation. Myopexy just means joining the muscles, okay? I didn't join them up, but I made them lined up. So I took one, I brought them up. I took the lower one and brought, brought the side one and brought it up this way and basically put them in the position they should be in, okay? And that creates all the world of difference in this situation. And that's just basically the little tomato that it looks like as soon as you've done surgery, okay? Because you got to cut through all that. But this is how she looked on the five, fifth day post-op. And you can see that that eye was pulled all the way up from the nose merely by repositioning the muscles. There was no miracles performed here. This is how it looked preoperatively. And just up, I didn't operate in the left eye at all, just on the right side, but just repositioning the muscles can change this. But that's why an accurate diagnosis is important. And this is why we come back to this lecture on double vision. Just wanna give you an idea about the things that we should think about. Okay, now sticking with the orbital conditions, 81 year old man gradually worsening oblique diplopia. Now we know oblique diplopia means that the images are not vertically separated right on top of each other. They're not horizontal, but they're kind of at a diagonal, okay? Oblique diplopia worsening over many months. Ptosis is a term I want to introduce. Many of you may know what it is, but it's just the upper eyelid droops, okay? There are neurological reasons for that. Most of the time, it's just stretch, especially in 81-year-old men the eyelids are going to stretch at times just because they go through what we call involutional changes, stretching, the connective tissues become stretch. And that of course is gonna happen, right? So this is the kind of, of thing that we can see here. So you see this deep upper eyelid over here. It almost has a deep sunken appearance, which when I see that, I think, okay, those orbital connective tissues that wrap up all these eye muscles nicely together may be stretched. And if they stretch, then they don't pull as well. The muscle is fine, but the nice organization of the muscles together is stretched a little bit, so they don't pull as hard, okay? The eye muscles themselves are okay, the nerves are okay, but the connective tissues that wrap everything up have become stretched over time, so they don't align as well, okay? 
So this is actually some very nice work that was done um, uh, by Dr. Joseph Diemer at UCLA a number of years ago. And we, we use this kind of uh, to, to show what we should see. This is the lateral rectus here. This is the superior rectus. And this is this nice band. This is how it should be in a, what we call a young control. <laughs> okay, so basically a nice band of tissue in between there that's not stretched. It's right in the right position. Superior rectus is where he should be. Lateral rectus is where she should be. Everything's perfect, okay? Now, let's say as you get older, SES, this is the unfortunate term called sagging eye syndrome, okay? But that's what it is here. Unfortunate, I say that. <laughs> I don't know why we call it that, but essentially it's a stretch of those tissues. And that band you can see here is ruptured. So that's why the muscles slide and they don't actually sit in the right position. And if that's the case, we can kind of re we can improve that by trying to not reattach this band, but move the eye muscles around to get the alignment better, okay? So we have to recognize that. So if your doctor asks for an MRI, he or she may be thinking about these possibilities, not only the nerves that are in the brain or the brainstem I mean, ruling out tumors, but he or she also may wanna see what this band looks like. May wanna see like the previous case, is there displacement of the muscles if you're somebody with high myopia and so forth, okay? So adjustable suture technique, I do about half of my cases now with adjustable suture technique, which is essentially a two-part problem, okay, or two-part series for the patient. The first thing is you go under for the first part, okay, the surgery itself, you go general anesthesia most of the time. And at that time, what we do is we tie the sutures in a way that one of the sutures, the, you see this purple stitch here? This purple stitch, okay, has the eye muscle on it, okay, we need to have the eye muscle secured on a stitch so we can do things with it. The white stitch here is tied in a noose knot around that purple stitch. And we can slide that white knot up or down while you're awake and looking at an eye chart to see if you line things up properly. Okay, so let's say we get you better. You, your images were like really far apart and now they're really much better. You're like, oh, thanks, much better, but I still have some double. Then I can take that white knot and say, okay, let's see. I can slide it back, slide it forward, depending on what you still have as a, as a double vision or as a misalignment, and it can give us exquisite control, okay? Exquisite control to get things as lined up as we can. Now, nobody is um, above just natural healing and all the things that have to play. There's still error bars around everything, but adjustable suture technique can give us so much more freedom and so much more flexibility and control over a situation that has inherent variability. Okay. And then we just basically tie this off. You don't go home with these souvenirs here. Okay. But you do, we tie them off and we basically secure the right back down to the muscle. And it looks like nothing happened except for, you know, just a bit of a red eye where we were mucking around. Okay. And that gets better over time. The adjustable suture techniques, 40 to 50% of my cases are used adjustable for a variety of reasons. Okay. Now, I know I'm going fast. Hopefully this is not boring you and just moving forward in terms of what we're thinking, but I'm trying to cover the brain here. And <laughs> so it takes some time, but now we're gonna talk a little bit about nerve muscle junction based conditions. Like what does that mean? <laughs> Thanks for the thumbs up. I appreciate it. Um, the, uh, the nerve muscle, well, okay. You have a good nerve, you have a good muscle, but the nerve has to tell the muscle what to do, right? So that, that communication between the nerve to the muscle is a, a complex neurophysiology. And there are conditions which can disrupt this connection between the nerve and the muscle. And I'm sure many of you heard of, have heard of myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is the most common of the nerve muscle junction disorders, although there are many others. The most common is myasthenia gravis. And we have a special form of myasthenia gravis, no, gravis known as ocular myasthenia gravis, where some patients will have only the ocular features, ptosis where their eyelids droop, or any form of double vision, okay? Having said that, many times I will see a patient who does not carry a diagnosis of myasthenia gravis, but we see the patient and we diagnose them with myasthenia gravis based on their eye findings. 80% of those individuals will go on within the next two years to develop generalized myasthenia gravis, which means oftentimes weakness of their, of their diaphragm, weakness of swallowing, weakness of um, their proximal muscles, sometimes even shortness of breath. So it's a very important condition to diagnose. And sometimes it happens through the eye clinic. And that's why we bring it up here because we all patient and physician have to be acutely aware of how these things can present, okay? 
62 year old men, three months of gradual onset of vertical double vision, one on top of the other, okay? The referring doctor, when he sent it to me, had noted left eye proptosis. I hope to give you some new terminology here, okay? Proptosis is essentially this, this finding where one eye is more forward compared to the other, okay? And it can appear proptotic as well. So sometimes when you sort of narrow your eyelid, the eye might appear sunken. If you sort of separate your eyelids, it might appear more forward. It doesn't necessarily have to be more forward, but it may appear that way, you see? And so proptosis is just that finding where the eye comes more forward, but sometimes proptosis can be apparent when the eyelid anatomy changes as well, okay? Just to give you an idea that we have to be careful. Now here's that patient, okay? And you can see why the doctor thought this left eye is, is sort of bulgy, right? And, and basically coming forward. This essentially, it might be bulging, but it could just be retraction as well, okay? Watch when I do that. I hope I'm scaring, I'm not scaring people, but when I do this, my eye looks more bulgy. They're already kind of bulgy, but they look even bulgier if I do this, okay? And you can see this one doesn't look as bulgy because the eyelid is droopy. So the question is, are the eyes bulging or are we getting that perception based on the different eyelid heights that are here, okay? And that's what we have to figure out. All right, so what I did in the office, because I thought he might have a neuromuscular junction problem like myasthenia gravis, because I saw this lid was sort of bouncing around. There were times it was closed, other times it was better just when I'm examining him. And when we see that, what we call moment to moment fluctuation, we get suspicious that it could be myasthenia gravis. So that variability is super key. In the office, I gave him a medication called Tensilon, which basically threw an IV. And look what happens. Everything just with four milligrams of Tensilon for like five to seven minutes, he looks normal, right? This lid comes down, that eyelid comes up. Even the, the all the muscle usage over here relaxes. His face even looks more, um, the muscles look more tense, less saggy because that Tensilon muscle, would, uh, Tensilon medication, what it did was it helped that neuromuscular junction, okay? It has a pharmacological way of doing that. It helps us diagnose that this is a problem with the neuromuscular junction. And because this medication wears off so quickly, so it's obviously not a good treatment, but it wears off quickly, in 10 minutes, we see him come back to his pre-existing state, pretty much identical to what he looked like before, okay? So this is what, very helpful. When I see that, I know what's going on. This is a patient that I saw literally last week, okay? L literally last week. She came in here complaining. She'd had no diagnosis of myasthenia gravis, anything like that. But she came in obviously with saying that my eyelid is drooping and my left eye is bulging, okay? And she had some double vision as well. When I was examining her, I noted that the lids were kind of fluctuating around and I thought, okay, let me get an ice pack. So I asked one of our, 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 our colleagues to get me an ice pack, one of those cold packs, I tortured her for two minutes by putting it on the upper eyelid and made it very cold, okay? <laughs> so, you know, I had to talk to her about it and talk to her about Alaska and all these things to try to get her out of her mindset of, you know, why she's cold. But I put it on there. The upper eyelid skin is very thin. So if you cool down the muscle, you slow down the breakdown and you basically, uh, you, you help that neuromuscular junction connection, okay? You basically help the conduction from the nerve to the muscle by spike, by cooling it down. So look at how it looked for, <laughs> I put that ice pack on there and it opened right up like this, okay? Just two minutes of ice, okay? Two minutes of ice and you can see a little frostbite <laughs> she's got there, okay? But just to prove that I, that I, you know, put the ice on there, but it goes up and it stays up like that. Um, and, and then again, goes right back down after a few minutes, okay? Because why? Well, you've got a lot of vascularity, a lot of blood flow to the upper eyelid so it'll warm up very, very quickly, okay? So it's, you can see that was a very positive ice pack test. That only happens in myasthenia gravis, okay? So if your doctor says, I wanna put an ice pack on your eye when they see a droopy lid and you're complaining of double vision, they may not be crazy, okay? They may be thinking about this. They may be thinking about this. And if it flies up like this, they're gonna feel like, they say, aha, I know what you have, okay? Because very few things do this. And then they can send you for a workup and all that kind of stuff for neurology and blood tests and everything else, okay? So ocular myasthenia gravis, okay? Variability, that's the key. Variability kind of fluctuates. When you ask people to close their eyes really tight, we should not be able to, to open it up like this, but I can open it up with a myasthenic like that because you're not strong there, okay? Often gets worse as the day progresses. 
That's true for many things. Okay, all of us feel more tired as the day progresses. Okay, let's be honest. But that's my senior grab is that is some one of those things that we see. Why we care about this diagnosis not only is that we can effectively treat it and you know get you back in your on your way with your double vision, but also like I said, it can be connected to a bigger picture. And if there's difficulty swallowing, shortness of breath, large muscle weakness, those are all important. And that means you need to have a more of a systemic management. But usually with ocular myasthenia gravis, we can treat this with medications, okay? Medications, and that helps a lot. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to the cranial nerves and the neurological conditions, okay? And I, the, 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 where the bread is buttered, okay? The things that you, you don't wanna have, generally speaking, but these are important. And that's why you come to see neuro ophthalmology or somebody who specializes in double vision, because they're trying to make sure these things are not there, okay? <laughs> Here's somebody who we have to actually elevate his upper eyelid because it's completely droopy, okay? It's totic. And if you look, I'll show you a larger picture. This pupil is larger too, okay? He's trying to look up, he can't look up. He's trying to look down with this eye, he's not able to, but the left eye looks just fine. He's able to look here to the right, this eye is doing just fine. But look, when he tries to look to the left, he cannot get that eye in, okay? So he's got a problem with elevation of the eyelid, elevation of the eye, depression of the eye, moving inward of the eye, but the only thing he can do is move the eye outward. And that's what we call a third nerve palsy, okay? The third nerve, like I mentioned, there's six muscles and there's three nerves. The one you don't wanna lose is the third nerve. The third nerve does most of the work, okay? The only two muscle, it only inter, doesn't innervate two of the six. So of those six muscles, it innervates four of those six, all right? Plus your pupil, plus your eyelid. So it actually does six different muscles, but of the six eye muscles, it, it innervates four of them, all right? So if that's the case and the pupil is involved like this and the pupil is larger, we become worried that there's something compressing that nerve and this doctor will send you for an MRI and an MRA or a CTA and a, and a CT, basically a CAT scan or an MR, looking at the blood vessels. And this is an aneurysm. This is, this is a real life patient. This is an aneurysm right over here. And that aneurysm is in the wrong spot. It pushes on the nerve. It pushes, it's, that third nerve travels just underneath that particular blood vessel. And if that blood vessel becomes aneurysmal, it can compress the nerve and therefore, you have a problem in that situation that needs to be and people can have an aneurysm you can coil it and they can do just fine but if you don't know about the aneurysm it can bleed and if it bleeds that can lead to significant uh, morbidity okay so that's very very important sometimes it can be quite subtle look at this little bit of ptosis little bit of lid droop okay and when the patient looks up he's just not quite able to get that eye up it's this is a partial third nerve palsy not a complete obvious third nerve palsy so we have to kind of be scrutinizing. We can't always expect patients to come in with the textbook kind of diagnosis where it's kind of easy to figure out. Sometimes we have to look closely and go, hey, why is that upper lid drooping a little bit? Hey, and also you're not able to look up that well. Hmm, that could be part of the third nerve. And that's what this was. So again, just want to give you an idea about what your doctor is going to have to kind of think about as they progress through the possibilities and I'm trying to lay it out anatomically, but also what we see along the way. Okay, again, not to get too crazy here, but a fourth nerve, as I mentioned, we have the three, the four, and the sixth. Those are the three nerves that innervate those six muscles, okay? This patient looks okay straight ahead, right? And when he looks to the right, looks okay. But look when he looks to the left, I put this yellow line across. And can you see how his right eye is way above that yellow line? And his left eye is way below that yellow line. It means when he looks to the left, his eyes become kind of skewed vertically like that. And that's because of a fourth nerve palsy on the right side. That's what we generally see. So if you come to me and, and you're complaining of double vision that's vertical, maybe a little bit of a rotational element, maybe a bit oblique, one of the first things I'll do is I'll look at you and then I'll have you look left and right. And I'll try to compare if they stay on an even keel or when you go to one side, does one go up like this? And it'll give me a bit, pretty big clue, okay? And those of you that are have been kind of studying your double vision and you see it and you might notice, okay, it's not just that I've got two images stacked like this. One image is kind of rotated, one is kind of twisted. Why is that? And that helps me. And I might ask you, well, which way is it tilted? Which way is it twisted? <laughs> see there. And that twist is something that we can measure. Okay, we have this very funky pair of glasses, which 
is my favorite thing in the whole clinic, which is called a double Maddox rod, okay? A double Maddox rod. Thanks, Dr. Maddox, for figuring this out. Basically, we will put these two lenses on you, turn down the lights, shine a light in the middle, and you're going to see two lines, okay? If you have double vision, you'll see two lines because each eye is going to see a different line, right? And they're not lined up, so you're going to see two lines. Now, one image is going to be twisted relative to the other, okay? Because you've got torsional double vision as well. And then there are these little knobs, which are just outside of the view. Maybe this you can see here. There's a little knob right there. And you can twist that little um, filter. And I can read how many degrees and in which direction it's moving with this little caliper up here. Can you see that? Those are the numbers there. That actually tells me how many degrees. And you could twist it this way, twist it that way. And then I'll be able to say, oh, that is a X cyclotorter image, an in cyclo image. I don't want to get too technical, but the direction of tilt or twist will help me as well determine what's going on. And believe it or not, it helps figure out what to do for you as well if we have to do something surgical or otherwise, okay? Because the eye muscles, we have to figure that out. So this is what you might see, okay? You might see two lines, right? So this left eye, this is another thing that's kind of trippy to get your head around a little bit. And when I was learning this for the first time, I'm like, how does this happen? But you figure out why is the lower eye, the lower eye always sees the higher eye, higher line, okay? <laughs> With the higher image. The higher eye, the one that's elevated, sees the lower image, okay? And you see that, that, that higher eye sees the lower image on an angle. So you have the patient twist that knob until they become parallel. And then I can read out how many degrees and, and, uh, and what direction, okay? And so that is a very, very helpful way for us to figure out fourth nerve policies versus other um, neurological things that cause this type of double vision. Okay, so what if you have, if you're unfortunate enough to have a bilateral fourth nerve palsy, you will see a lot of twist. This is looking inside the eye, okay? Just to give you a, a picture of what we see when we look inside your eye, okay? This yellow line is how things should be oriented, okay? This black part right here is dark part. That's your fovea, that's the center of your vision. That should be pretty much in line with your optic nerve. This patient has it very twisted, okay? Very twisted, you see that? It's very twisted on both sides. That's a bilateral fourth nerve palsy, super important. That only happens due to tumors, hydrocephalus, or trauma, okay? Trauma meaning somebody had a severe blunt head injury where they cause a, a real shaking of the nerves and things became stretched. We see that with car accidents. We see that sometimes with motorcycle accidents and so forth. Closed head injuries that are significant enough that can happen. But we also see this with tumors and so forth. And that's what we can see. This is a patient that had hydrocephalus where the fourth nerve goes right through here. And because there's so much fluid there, it got stretched. Okay. So this is why the brain scan might be helpful if your doctor sees something that looks like a bilateral fourth nerve palsy to him or her. Okay. Okay. Now I want to just summarize this. I hope I've been, been concise enough, but not getting too crazy. Monocular versus binocular. That's important to us for the various reasons. You can see if it's a matter of tears or cataract, it's very different than, you know, having, needing to do a brain scan and we need to figure out what the differences are. Okay. The pattern of misalignment is important, which I've been trying to stress. How does it look? Is a double vision always side to side, vertical? How does it change? That's what we have to figure out, okay? And you don't have to figure that out, but you might have an idea like, oh yeah, my double vision is way worse over here or way worse over here versus here. And that would be helpful information. And then we localize. It's all about location, right? For us, this is a kind of a, a real estate kind of mentality in neuro-ophthalmology is we have to figure out where the problem is before we have any clue about what the problem is, okay? We think about the orbit and the eye muscles about the neuromuscular junction, about the nerves, the three, four, and the six, and the brain. I put brain because there's so many areas, but we have to think about it in, in kind of a neurological versus an eye issue, okay? Good, well, I really appreciate your time. Uh, I'm, here, I'm here for questions. If you have any questions, any comments, um, this is our phone number to the clinic. And anytime you wanna make an appointment uh, with any of us, obviously, please do. Here's my email if you wanna write it down and, have a question for me, I'd be happy to, um, to um, you know, entertain anything of that. I think my email is also on our website, so it's nothing um, sacred, but it's there, but definitely please uh, 
reach out if there's anything we can, you know, we can help with. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Does anybody have any questions you'd like to ask? Oh, there's something in the Anyone chat, there? Dr. Patel. Oh, yeah. Mr. Ogden, yes. Uh, what are uh, what other causes for, uh, for fourth nerve palsy? Okay, great question. So bilateral, like I mentioned, you know, trauma, tumor, and so forth. Unilateral, meaning one-sided, which is much more common than bilateral, fourth nerve palsy. Most of the time, it is some sort of a decompensation of an old fourth nerve palsy. Many of us are born with, believe it or not, a slight asymmetry in the caliber of our fourth nerves between the left and the right. And we go around many years not having any problem because the body adapts, okay? But as we age and other things happen, vision changes and so forth, that compensation can become that much more weak, okay? And then we develop what we call a decompensated fourth nerve palsy. In my practice, that is not an insignificant proportion of, of fourth nerve palsies. Uh, other times, it could be trauma again, okay? It could be post-surgical, a lot of not cataracts or anything, but neurosurgical because if, if you're unfortunate enough to have, to have something done in that area, oftentimes the fourth nerve is stretched, but also diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, those are all things that can give you a fourth nerve palsy. Okay. All right, great. And what about the sixth nerve? Yes, I, I could have talked more about that, but it was one of the, the simpler nerves as opposed to the other ones that, that kind of keep us up at night. The sixth nerve is, as I mentioned before, innervates just the lateral rectus, which is the muscle that pulls the eye outward. Okay. And you have a left one and a right one. If your sixth nerve isn't working, then the eye is going to be turned in toward the nose. Okay. Now, if it's not working at all, it'll be quite turned in. If it's working partially, well, not as much, but it's basically get horizontal binocular double vision. Okay. Now the sixth nerve, most of the time, the sixth nerve is, is affected is because of diabetes or hypertension or cholesterol. We call that microvascular or ischemic, which means circulation issues. Vast majority of the time it's that. Okay. Now those usually get better anywhere between six weeks to six months. It's a huge range that we, that we kind of tell because it does vary quite a bit, but most get better. Many times it can be related to there being, um, it, 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 it can be related to um, uh, there being uh, a tumor there. There can be stretch. There can be a lot of different things that go on, but most of the time a six nerve palsy is related uh, to a diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol. Okay. So diabetes can cause double vision, specifically in the context that we mentioned, if it affects any of those nerves, the third nerve, the sixth nerve, and the fourth nerve are all prone or capable of being damaged by the diabetes, the diabetic condition. So we know what, hap what we think happens over time is diabetes expect, uh, affects those small blood vessels, and those small vessels that are affected, they affect the circulation to the nerve that feeds that muscle. And it's not a permanent damage usually, usually that recovers, the circulation recovers over, like I said, several weeks to months and improves, okay? I hope that answered that question. So is double or blurry vision caused by brain problems or eye problem? So uh, either, right? As, as I mentioned, so blurry vision, um, blurry vision can be so many things. It could be anything from glasses to retinal problems to glaucoma, cataract. So, so blurry vision is, very, is a very general um, a concern, right? And so we have to kind of look at it from front to back. Is there correctable of glasses? No. Okay. Is there a cataract? No. Is there a corneal problem? No. If we look inside the eye. Um, is there a retinal issue? Maybe. Is there an optic nerve problem? So we have to kind of figure out why the eye is blurry first. Okay. Double vision, as I mentioned, can be monocular, meaning you have an image that separates and becomes kind of uh, broken up even with just one eye open, or it's truly binocular, meaning that they're misaligned. But if you cover one eye, you just see one image, and then we try to figure out why that's misaligned. So generally speaking, they are different. Okay, um, but this is sort of the art of looking through it. Good questions here. Uh, how does thyroid malfunction affect? You mentioned thyroid, so I ask you. Okay, so thyroid disease, especially Graves' disease. Okay, Graves' disease is more of an autoimmune phenomenon. Graves' disease can affect what we call the orbital fibroblasts. There are muscles, there are sort of these cells within the orbit, okay, in the eye socket, uh, which can become turned on by immunoglobulins or antibodies that, you, that are being produced against your thyroid gland, okay? So we have these things, these immunoglobulins called TSI, and they are produced against the thyroid gland causing an autoimmune problem with your thyroid. But those same antibodies can also attack the eye muscles, 
okay? And when they attacks the eye muscles through those fibroblasts, it causes there to be scarring and inflammation in those eye muscles. And that scarring and inflammation then leads to the things that I showed you. They get enlarged, they become scarred, fibrotic, and therefore the eyes start to pull apart, okay? That's really the main way that the thyroid malfunction is through that autoimmune process of affecting the muscles and the orbital fat, okay? Um, after a TBI or stroke, how long would you wait until you consider surgical intervention? Do you recommend any eye therapy if deviation is not stable if there's no suppression? That's a great question. So if there's a TBI or, or, or stroke, and now if, if there's a general TBI, which are separate things in which you don't have specific involvement of a nerve, okay? Some, so there's mild, moderate, and severe TBI. Mild TBI, like, uh, like a concussion, generally speaking, you wanna wait at least six to nine months before you do anything permanent, like a surgical thing uh, for a TBI. Now, if you've had severe TBI, where you've had bleeding in the brain, disruption of nerves, the nerves have actually separated and, and, and become damaged in that context, then that's something that you, generally speaking, know what you're gonna get within about six months, okay? Within about six months, if you've had separation of the nerve, at that point, it's usually pretty much, um, you know, the story has been told by that time. These are very open, broad numbers, but I'm generally speaking, six months is a sort of a, a bifurcation point for us. We sometimes wait longer for mild TBI because these problems can be a little bit more nonspecific in that situation. But I wouldn't do anything surgically before six months in either case. Okay, and then watch people to see if their uh, issue with their double vision is stable. If it's stable, then we can consider it. But we want stability for a few months, generally speaking, because the last thing you want to do is start to intervene and the patient is on their own going to improve even to some degree. Stroke, six to nine months is the magic numbers <laughs> that we gave you for that, because that's actually the period of time in which swelling reduces in the brain. And then we are sort of left with what we're left with, you know, at that point, because the brain does not regenerate, but things do improve to some degree as swelling around a stroke settles down to some degree, okay? And as that occurs, and it's hard to know how much that will happen, we don't really know that between before six to nine months in most situations. Now, strokes, as you know, can be a little focal stroke where it affects one tiny blood vessel, or it can be a massive stroke where you get basically an entire territory that's affected and then that answer would vary quite a bit based on what you're seeing. But in general, any ischemic damage to the brain or traumatic damage to the brain, six months is a probably a pretty good point at which we, we do. Eye therapy, yes. Um, vision therapy for this type of thing, it, it's quite controversial because a lot of people will, you know, have, have busy clinics with it and there can be a, a lot of, um, you know, out of pocket pay and all that kind of stuff. And some people I think do a very good job with with helping promote good alignment and improvement in that context. And I think that that's something that optometrists do very well, neurooptometrists do very well. There's a whole subset, not neuro-ophthalmology, but neurooptometry where they may encourage these things. And if people have um, issues with alignment fusion, like bringing the eyes together, which is called convergence or divergence, we can train those things nicely using exercises. I generally recommend those. I feel like there's nothing wrong with doing those exercises in particular if you've had a traumatic brain injury. Um, vestibular therapy, which is basically trying to have your inner ear work well with your eyes. Uh, there are vestibular therapists that can work with you. My experience has been that if you don't have much improvement within about three to four months, then it's kind of at a plateau at that point. But I do encourage people to try, at least in the beginning when we're waiting for things to settle down, okay? Really the best elixir for these things is time, okay? Um, so, okay, question here. The patient with thyroiditis with fatty deposits, proptosis and strabismus issues, what is the correct sequence of, sep of separate eye surgeries for the eye? If a patient has cataracts with TED, orbital decompression, <laughs> great question. Okay, so um, basically the three main surgeries for thyroid eye disease, is an orbital decompression where if the eye is bulging forward or the optic nerve is becoming squished, you got to make room, okay? That basically is removing the bone around the eye socket to make room for the optic nerve and for the eye muscles and for the eye to move back, okay? Generally speaking, we do that first because it changes the eye muscle position, all right? So we do that first. Usually if you need a bilateral decompression, they'll do one side and then two to three weeks later, they'll do the other side. Once that has 
been done and uh, appropriately done, we wait at least six weeks after that for everything to settle down to see where the eye muscles are, okay, and where the eye position is. At that point, usually six months, six weeks or even longer, at that point, we will entertain doing strabismus surgery where we will move the eye muscles to try to get the alignment. Usually we do both eyes at the same time because the eyes have to work together. It's not like cataract surgery or even decompression surgery where you do them sequentially. We do this together because it's about alignment, okay? And then the eyelids can be done. Oftentimes, as I was showing you, there's eyelid retraction. There's all kinds of other things that can happen with the eyelids. Then the eyelids are settled down by the ocular, uh, by the uh, um, um, the oculoplastic specialist. So the first is strabismus, uh, sorry, <laughs> decompression. Number two, strabismus. Number three, the eyelids, okay? If the patient also has cataracts with thyroid eye disease, it it really doesn't matter too much if the orbital decompression and strabismus are done before the cataract surgery. The reason I say that is because if the cataract is severe enough, it should be taken out before because you can't get really good strabismus measurements when the patient isn't seeing very well, okay? So if the patient's not seeing that well because of their cataracts, you can't get good alignment measurements because you get blurry images out of them, okay? But if the cataract is relatively mild, okay, and it's not obstructing vision too much, then we go with the order that affects the patient the most, meaning that if their vision is 20, 30, 20, 40, but they're maddened by this double vision, right, that's taking place, or their optic nerve is getting compressed, then we don't mess around with the cataract surgery. You make room for those optic nerves with the decompression that's done relatively urgently, and then the strabismus, then the cataract. Okay, so it's based on the severity of the problem. Uh, what is a treatment for ocular only MG? Okay. Pyrrhotostigmine, which is mastinon. Mastinon is a medication that helps basically um, keep that neurotransmitter called acetylcholine around longer in that cleft, okay? So it, uh, it assists the nerve in communicating with the muscle, and that's pyrrhotostigmine, which is, the, which is the, the, trade, the, um, the generic name, but the trade name is called mastinon. And usually we take that 60 milligrams three times a day, okay? That's the first line. Number two, beyond that, let's say you don't do that well with the mesonon or you don't have a complete resolution of your eye movements, which is often the case, prednisone is the next line. So prednisone, generally speaking, we start up to about 40, 50 milligrams, high doses, then we sort of slowly bring that down, okay? Most patients with ocular-only myasthenia gravis are gonna do well with a combination of mesonon and prednisone. Some of them need what's called intravenous immunoglobulin, okay? Uh, which is like a neurology helps us with that. They get intravenous immune, uh, basically immunoglobulins, which is uh, proteins that help fight your immune system because this is an autoimmune condition. And that's re that requires monthly infusions. Um, it, hurt, it works very well, but it's something that is relatively uncommon to have to do, thankfully, okay? And then there are other medications as well. There's a new medication called eculizumab, which has now been... Um, um, uh, authorized by the FDA for myasthenia gravis, which works very well for patients with ocular and systemic myasthenia gravis. The vast majority will do well with mesonon and prednisone. Okay. All righty. Um, so would you suggest vision therapy to help strengthen eye muscles before? Yes. Yeah. So in some situations, like for example, convergence insufficiency, where somebody has a problem with convergence, because their eyes are sort of drifted outward, and they have a problem with convergence, in particular when the image comes closer to them. Convergence exercises are something we often recommend, basically what we call pencil push-ups. you know, something like this, where you take a pencil and you basically bring it slowly toward your nose and you watch your eyes converge. And then you slowly go back, they're like a push-up. <laughs> and you do 10 of those in a row, a couple of times a day. And you try that for two, three, four weeks. And many people will notice that they're getting improvement in convergence, okay? Divergence is a little bit trickier, but basically you're doing that keeping focus and you're moving outward like this and moving outward, getting them to diverge. It's not as powerful as convergence, but it can work. There are these things known as Brock strings. Okay, I'll write it down here, Brock strings. You can get them online. And those Brock strings are basically, and they have a, you know, instructions with them, they're beads on a string which you can use to help promote convergence and divergence, okay? I don't find that vision therapy is that great at, at strengthening a vertical deviation. For people who have 
a vertical separation, vision therapy tends not to work very well because we don't have very good ver a vertical fusion. Our brains, because our eyes are obviously separated side by side, not one on top of the other, we have very little fusional capacity vertically. So there's really not much ability to work that out or to promote or help exercise that. Whereas convergence and divergence, we are much better at that as human beings. So that's something that can be promoted and worked on to some degree. So we often do try that in many situations, okay? Is eye stroke preventable? How to prevent it? Uh, an, an eye stroke, I think that what you may be referring to is called an ischemic optic neuropathy, which is not the, the topic here, but it, basically it's a circulation problem to the eye. And generally speaking, the short answer is it's not preventable in that we have anything to give that would stop it from occurring. But the risk factors are hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, as well as sleep apnea that's not being treated, okay? But that's not everybody that has those things because that's 30% of the population, right? But you have to have an anatomical predisposition, which means your optic nerve, when you look inside the eye, the optic nerve is what we call tight or small. If you have that anatomical predisposition of a tight optic nerve with those risk factors, then the, the risk for a stroke of the optic nerve um, increases, okay? So prevention, if you have sleep apnea, you wanna try to address it. Try to um, address your blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, obviously easier said than done, but being in a good range with those things is good with exercise and diet and so forth, okay? If your doctor tells you that you have one of those susceptible optic nerves where they're kind of tight, that's an important thing. You can't change that, I can't change that, that anatomical, um, you know, predisposition, but that's something you would kind of want to know. We also tell men who have those risk factors, small optic nerve um, and the other risk factors to avoid the erectile dysfunction medications, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, because there is a tangible increase in risk. Obviously, there's way more usage of those medications than those who develop an ischemic optic neuropathy, thankfully, but in the right setup, it can be a problem, okay? So we want to kind of keep all of that together. Hopefully I answered that. Great. Okay. Well, it looks like, oh, it looks like uh, you've answered everybody's questions tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. It was a great lecture. Thank um, you. Again, we have been recording this lecture and it'll take us a little bit of time to edit it and post it on our website. And I will send the link to everybody who registered this evening. Um, thank you so much for attending and we hope to see you at our future lectures. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Thanks for listening.